arrancamos. Okay, good morning. For those of you who need translation, there's headsets outside, and this will be partly in English and partly in Spanish. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Erika de la Garza, and it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Baker Institute Latin America Initiative to this morning's installment of our Vecinos Lecture Series. We are honored to have the distinguished poet, Javier Sicilia, join us for a discussion of Mexico's drug-related violence and the role of the United States in it. Before we begin, I'd like to express my gratitude to our co-sponsors, Rice University's Department of Hispanic Studies, the Americas Research Center, the Office of Public Affairs, and Literal Magazine. Our very special thanks go to Manuel Gutierrez, Assistant Professor of Hispanic Studies at Rice, for facilitating our guest visits to Rice. The topic of this morning event is a complex and often contentious one. I will leave the discussion to the experts on today's panel. But I will say this. Tens of thousands of Mexicans have died in drug-related violence, especially over the last six years. And these lives, not to mention other economic and social costs, must be included in any discussion of US drug policy and Mexico's security policy. Javier Cecilia, who has lost a son to drug-related violence in Mexico, knows firsthand the terrible human price exacted by the drug-related policies in Mexico and in the United States. And he has embarked on a campaign to raise awareness of this issue here in the US. By putting a human face on drug-related violence in Mexico, Javier Cecilia is reminding us the need to straightforwardly confront the cost of these policies. In a real sense, he embodies what the great English poet Percy Shelley meant when he called poets the unacknowledged legislators of the world. He is joined this morning by two Baker Institute experts, Dr. Bill Martin, who among his many accomplishments is the Institute's senior fellow in drug policy, and Dr. Tony Payan, the Institute Visiting Fellow on Immigration and Border Studies. I don't have time to detail their many accomplishments uh, but I invite you instead to read their impressive biographies in our programs. Mr. Cecilia will give a 15 to 20 minute presentation. Then our panelists will engage in a 30 minute conversation among themselves with Dr. Payan also acting as moderator. We will then have 20 minutes to address some of, our written, some of your written questions. Our wonderful Baker Institute staff, whom we also thank for their help uh, putting this event together, will be passing out cards for your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bill Martin, Tony Payan, but above all, our very special guest, Javier Cecilia. No, ah, ya. Yo dije, pues, ¿dónde están? Aquí en Combo. Pues muchas gracias, buenas tardes. Buenos días, perdón. Ya no sé ni a qué horas vivo. Llevamos 15 días rodando y, y, y no. Este, bueno, yo no soy un experto aquí, hablarán los expertos. Soy un hombre que padeció en carne propia pues la violencia generada por esta guerra mataron a mi hijo y con, junto con él a seis muchachos y detrás de ellos hay una enorme cantidad de jóvenes que están perdiendo la vida y que no eran adictos, que no fumaban, que habían terminado sus carreras, que estaban ya trabajando, tratando de insertarse y de apoyar y de desarrollar el país 
Y esta guerra se los llevó. ¿Para qué? Para disque proteger o evitar el consumo de los 23 millones de adictos que tienen los Estados Unidos. 23 millones que no ha bajado. El, el, el problema en ese sentido está mal planteado. Es, es un planteamiento equivocado. La droga no es un problema. El problema son las adicciones. Estados Unidos es un país de adictos. Habría que perseguir a los gordos, a los consumidores de McDonald's, a los alcohólicos. Bueno, están mal planteando el problema. La droga siempre ha existido. El problema es que en una sociedad hipereconomizada la droga se volvió pues, un asunto de consumo, como lo es el alcohol, el, el vino también era sagrado. El que comía es uno del legítima, el mercado, el, esta sociedad del consumo, de la producción, de la pero bueno, decidieron perseguirla como alguna vez decidieron perseguir el alcohol en este país. El presidente Nixon en 1971 declara una guerra mundial contra las drogas, que se convierte lamentablemente en una política de Estado, no de gobierno. Aquí no son los demócratas o los republicanos los que es una política de Estado. Ha sido igual con los republicanos que con los ha sido igual con Bush y ha sido peor con Obama. Y quizá sea igual, se hará peor con el que viene, porque está desatada en ese orden. México, pues las consecuencias son eso. Tenemos, además, no hay, no hay una cifra clara. Empezaron a contar a los muertos, a los desaparecidos, a partir de hace un año y medio cuando salimos a protestar. No había antes nada. Se están matando entre ellos desde el presidente. Los inocentes son el 1% y son bajas colaterales. Algo habrán hecho. Discurso que con el estropajo del eufemismo es el mismo discurso que los nazis, son piojos, son ratas, no merecen ser contadas, así está de grave el asunto. Estos muertos en cinco años, cuando se destape verdaderamente, hagamos el conteo, nos vamos a aterrar, si ya nos aterramos va a ser peor. Will be terrified. Ha costado más vidas que lo que en 40 años podría haber costado el consumo de los adictos de droga. En México, la estadística dice que mueren 400 personas por consumo de Estamos hablando que en 5 años tendríamos 1,000. Uh, uh, we would have uh, 2,400 no, in six years, let's say. But no, we have 70,000 people dead, 20,000 disappear, 150,000 displaced, uh, some injured, mutilated, dead in the highways, on the highways. Uh, really, it's a total anarchy in Mexico, and the government is responsible because it's a very corrupt government in Mexico nowadays, a government with institutions that have, uh, that are really rotten, uh, and as we call them so often, and they have decided to carry out this war following the guidelines from the United States. Again, the, the war against drugs uh, are here in the U.S., but also the weapons that are arming the armed forces of Mexico to fight drug trafficking come from here also, but also from here is where all the weapons originate that are arming the drug trafficking, arming the drug traffickers, the criminals. So 
we have been exported a war. Uh, the problem is now that the violence is coming here and there won't be any border, any wall or any army deployed along the thousands of miles of this border that will be able to stop it because it's not on the Mexican side. It's on the side of the business that the war generates. It's on your side too. One day, these weapons, this war business will turn against you if we don't change the policies, if we don't face the war against drugs the way it should be faced, the way President Roosevelt faced the problem of alcohol, by legalizing it, by imposing the control of the state, the rules of the state, because the war, it's only beating the warlords right now. The, state is kneeling in front of the war capitals. It benefits only the mafia system. It benefits only corrupt office officials. It benefits those who invest in jails, in prisons, the police, armies. It's just the business of death, the business of the blood of others is the business of grief. And the problem is that both countries are allowing this. And the citizens of the United States don't want to face the problem. It's very sad sometimes to hear people on the road saying, it's your problem. It is not. It's a problem that we both have. Uh, you always accuse, uh, as they say, well, we have but we have already pointed out what the problems are with our government. We have come here because the problem is here. But if the citizens of the U.S. don't help us, if you don't take this matter seriously, there won't be any way to overcome this war. And it will reach you too. The problem is we're losing our democracies. It, it took us, you know, the, the U.S. is a strange country. It's the country of democracies, the country of the founding fathers who gave democracy to the world before the French revolution but however it has generated and sponsored authoritarian regimes military regimes in Latin America uh, here in the US even with African Americans they did not have their civil rights until the 50s the 60s they had to rise up and now with the war against drugs, they're being criminalized again. Let's look at the number of African Americans who are in jail now in the U.S. for uh, drug-related offenses, uh, drug trafficking offenses, drug consumption offenses. How many Latin Americans? And uh, there seems to be, you know, there, there's a, a drug that's good and drug that's bad. The drugs that Charlie Sheen can consume, those are good. Or Paris Hilton, no problem with them. They can promote that. Uh, they can. Uh, make a big fuzz and uh, that's fine but a black person cannot a Latin American a Hispanic mainly if they are poor if they live in marginalized area this is a war against people we have to stop it uh, the US is a contradictory country they uh, uh, it's a scandal uh, because somebody consumes uh, drugs, because it's a matter of freedom, but uh, there's no scandal with weapons being sold anywhere. Uh, the drugs, you know, it's it's a problem with addiction. We, we cannot say that everybody who consumes alcohol is an alcoholic, uh, not everybody who smokes a marijuana cigarette or opium is an addict. We have to distinguish between uh, people. But weapons, yeah, they are really, uh, they have one, just one effect, mainly those assault weapons, automatic weapons, and that does not create a big scandal. But it is a big scandal when somebody smokes a joint. Gosh, I don't know. There's, there's a kind of serious schizophrenia in this country. You have to face it, just like we have a polyphrenia. I mean, the corruption in our country is humongous. The capacity for disaster, for disorder in our country is tremendous. But it's a bilateral agenda, and we have to help each other, correct each other. When governments, and I'll finish with this, when governments 
miss their main purpose, which is to establish peace, to maintain justice, then they have already lost the role as a state and citizens. We have to stand up and help them correct their ways, change their path. And this is a road that needs to get to peace by facing the problem of drugs, the problem of weapons, and the problem of money laundering in a different way. It's not just uh, uh, recently uh, uh, HSNBC was discovered, the bank uh, laundering $18 billion. So we no have 70,000 people dead. Now, because of violence, we don't have any official under arrest. Mexico uh, imposed a fine of 365 million pesos to this bank. That means nothing. That fine cleaned up all that crime, the money laundering of $18 billion. We're talking about a very perverse system, and it's the business of war. So if we don't change those policies, hell will be here for many, many decades, not just in Mexico, but in Latin America and in the United States. You may not be seeing this, but I feel that the militarization of this country is going in that direction. The uh, uh, traffic stops, the controls that we have to gone through, I thought they existed only in the state of Chiapas uh, with the war against Mexico, Mexico, but I see the militarization here, and I think that should concern you. Thank you very much. Well, it's it's very hard to follow uh, a um, the, the wise words of uh, Mr. Javier Sicilia, uh, particularly because he speaks from his heart. He's a poet and a philosopher, and obviously he speaks because he has experienced himself uh, in the death of his son, the kind of violence that has been going on in Mexico. Um, I, I will not attempt to even come close, but I will offer some reflections on this. Uh, and first, uh, let me um, uh, direct some words to Mr. Cecilia himself. Uh, bienvenido a Houston, en donde yo mismo soy un huésped. Eh, bienvenido por, por ofrecernos sus palabras de bring your wise words and your reflections about this very important topic that we're discussing today. <laughs> Let me just uh, um, uh, reflect on what has been said, and I've been listening to Mr. Cecilia's words along the way as he has traversed Mexico and now uh, the southern part of the United States from San Diego and on to Washington, D.C., with a stop here with us in, in Houston. The thing that most intrigues me is how to turn a protest into a movement and then into public policy. And this is a great forum to talk about this a little bit because obviously we need to turn this into public policy. And this is an institute that deals with public policy. And I've seen the uh, moment of protest in the streets in Mexico City, and I've seen the moment in which the protest turned into a movement and many other voices joined Mr. Cecilia's voice into a movement. But now we need to think about how to turn it into public policy, how to make, how to take the next step, how to make that leap. Uh, I think civil society activism is always the beginning. I think capturing the discourse is always the beginning. And we cannot miss the importance of what Mr. Cecilia is doing here. He is turning the discourse, beginning to capture the imagination of a lot of minds and a lot of people about the possibilities of what can be different. And this is not unimportant because there's always been uh, people that have challenged the cultural mores of their time. I just, I can think of Jesus himself challenging the very mores of his time and paying with his life for it. He was crucified because he challenged the norms established in, um, in the region. 
I can think of Martin Luther King, who also challenged the culture of his time in specific policies, embodied in policies of discrimination and segregation. And he also paid with his life. And I go back to my own hometown, Chihuahua, and Maricela Escobedo, who also challenged the injustice in the state of Chihuahua, the most violent state in Mexico, my own hometown, and she also paid with her life. So from the biggest, Jesus, to the middle, Martin Luther King, to the smaller, Maricela Escobedo, they've all paid with their lives. So there's something to be said about challenging the culture and about having the courage and being here to challenge our minds and the way we think and to begin to capture our imagination and to begin to say, we need to think differently about this problem. It simply is not paying off. After 40 years, and in El Paso, Bill Martin may remember, in 2009, we organized a conference in September 19th and 20th, the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the closing of the border, the U.S.-Mexico border um, operation intercept in 1969 by President Richard Nixon then, the first time that there was an aggressive militaristic move to close the U.S.-Mexico border and the disaster that it represented in 1969. And we organized this conference in which we analyze the results of drug policy in this country and we realize that after 40 years and now 43, it hasn't paid off. Why do we keep doing the same thing after 40 some years of a policy that has essentially failed? In a normal issue, as I call a normal public policy issue, there are real changes. Let me give you an example. If a plane crashes, immediately all the bureaucracies descend on the site and they review the air control procedures, the norms, uh, the, the, um, the interaction, the communications between the plane and the tower, the structure of the airplane, and it turns into actual prescriptions for policy to prevent future accidents. That's a normal public policy issue. But in drugs, it hasn't worked. When it comes to drug policy, that has not worked at all. Evidence has shown over and over and over again that it has not worked. Drugs are today more abundant than ever before. The variety of drugs is greater than ever before. The amount is greater. The prizes are cheaper, and that's the number one measure of success. Whether the price has gone up, it means the drugs are scarce. But the prices are lower and more accessible than ever before. So the policy has actually had the opposite effect. I'm not implying that the policy has caused this. I'm simply saying that the policy has not fulfilled its objectives. And yet we continue with the same policy. <clears throat> And short of insanity, I'm not sure how to define that policy. And those are not my words, obviously. Uh, we need to redimension this policy. And we need to rethink what is going on here with drug policy. There are many, many ways to tackle vice. There is education, there is prevention, there is treatment, and there is enforcement. The whole chain, we ought to look at the whole chain. And we have successful cases in history, such as tobacco. In the 19, early 1960s, some 60% of Americans smoked. Today, 18%. 40 years, 40 some years of a sustained campaign have reduced tobacco consumption. But we don't want to do the same thing with drugs. We don't want to turn away from a prohibitionist perspective to a control, damage control perspective. Risk is never going to be zero, but we seem to be hell bent on a policy to bring the risk down to zero. That is to bring drug trafficking and drug use down to zero. And it's not, it's not working. We may try another 40 years and maybe in another 40 years it'll work. I don't dare to say that, that it will not work 
but 40 some years haven't yet worked. And I wanna say something, I don't do drugs, I've never done them, and I don't recommend my students at all to do drugs ever. In fact, I tell my students that, some of, some of whom smoke marijuana, that it makes them stupid and dumb. <laughs> and I don't recommend it. But I have to respect their ability to choose and to decide, just as they decide whom to vote for, whether they want to smoke marijuana or not, even though I personally disapprove of it. But I will not go as far as to use the apparatus and the force of the state to control their behavior in that regard. I think law enforcement has been overemphasized and education, prevention, and treatment have not. We dedicate billions and billions and billions of dollars to drug policy on the enforcement side. Well, picture a, if you were going to the gym every day and you only exercise one arm. You would have a big, musculous arm and the rest of your body would be kind of withering away. Well, that is what we're doing with with drug policy. We only exercise the law enforcement side, but the development side, the preventive side, the education side, we don't do very much of that. So we need to redimension the policy and begin to take a look at the billions of dollars that we spend on this and begin to say, okay, how much of this is going to go to education? How much is going to go to prevention, to treatment? Because it is a disease. We now think of obese people as sick. We think of people who are alcoholics as sick, but we think of people who are addicted to drugs as criminals. We have chosen to emphasize a particular dimension in what is really a chain, a link in what is really a much, much larger uh, chain. And in that sense, I think we have distorted policy. Drug policy is distorted. And we need to redimension these different aspects of drug policy and begin to work on all of them because we know what happens when we distort policy. When we distort public policy and emphasize only one side, we know that it produces violence. And it doesn't take very much to move from protest to movement to public policy. Um, Mr. Cecilia made a reference to the 1960s and the civil rights movement. Only 2% of Americans participated in the civil rights movement. 2%. 98% of the country was essentially unmoved at home watching it on TV. But 2% changed the policy and completely changed the civil rights landscape in this country. It doesn't take very much, but it does take strategic thinking. It takes leadership and it takes strategic thinking. And I will say something about that and then I'll let Bill um, give us some his own reflections. I think that we have to think about what comes next. It has been a, a great ride to watch Mr. Cecilia and, and this protest and this movement throughout Mexico and in the southern part of the United States. But now we have to ask ourselves, what about the public policy? How can we engage the public policy process? And let me go back to William Buckley the father of American conservatism. In the 1960s, Mr. Buckley began to preach the doctrine of conservatism in this country. And everybody in this country, because between the 30s and the 60s, this country was the liberal era of this country. And in the 1960s, Mr. Buckley began to talk about conservative ideas. What we know today is conservative ideas. They're mainstream today. The guy managed to move the country, to capture the discourse and the imagination of a country and move this country to the right and make it conservative. This is a conservative country and he moved it to the right. And everybody thought in the 1960s, this is a crazy guy, a loony, who's out there in the fringes of society. And today, a lot of his ideas are mainstream. Not all, by the way. <laughs> and Bill will refer to that in a minute. But he was thought of as crazy. And yet, he started there on TV, on a TV show, talking about his ideas and never stopped talking. So one of the ways to do it is we have to capture the discourse first and foremost. And I think Mr. Cecilia's greatest contribution is that he's recapturing that discourse. It wasn't Jesus who made Christianity the great movement that it is. 
as we were saying in a conversation just last weekend, it was St. Paul. And St. Paul in that Bible says clearly faith comes from hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. We need to repeat the message over and over and over in every single forum that we can until it becomes mainstream, until it becomes acceptable. St. Paul said that. We need to, after capturing the discourse, we need to build coalitions. Who are our allies? Who are the people that are on our side? Who are, who are those people watching TV that are kind of quietly sitting there and probably find it reasonable to listen to this message but would not be mobilized otherwise? Who are these people? Who are the people that should be at the table? Who should we bring to the table? And yes, we need to join political parties. And yes, we need to run candidates. We need to place people in strategic places so that they can begin to move policy. <clears throat> Otherwise, we will never go from protest to movement and they'll stop right there. And we'll be just one more movement that will not result in true change in policy and then cultural change. We get to get the non-voting to vote. We got to get people out to the polls. It's all right to get them out in the streets to yell and to scream and to protest, but it is important to get them to the polls. We live in democracies, imperfect though they may be in both countries. We need to mobilize the immobile. We need to get more consciences out there, not necessarily in the streets themselves, but to transform this energy into actual strategies for public policy. I'll say one more thing about Mexico and what is coming up. In, in Mexico, and I will throw a couple of questions on the table uh, for uh, Mr. Cecilia. On the July 1st elections, the PRI won the elections, won in quotation marks. We don't know. <laughs> we don't really know what happened in, in the even more imperfect democracy that Mexico is. Um, somebody said that you know elections today, whether in the US or in Mexico, could be settled with a coin toss. It, it seems to me reasonable because they often make no difference for public policy anyway. Witness immigration, witness drug policy, and many other issues that you kind of might as well um, do a um, coin toss. I, and this is a question for Mr. Mr. Cecilia, um, I think the pre won in Mexico by appealing to the right it had to move to the right of the PAN. The PAN being the right-wing party, the PRI won by moving to the right. The PRI has lost the left. And the PRI is coming back to power to demonstrate that it is the right. By moving to the right of the PAN, the PRI has essentially, um, or is essentially going to pursue the same policies as the PAN, or even more radically so, because it has to demonstrate that it is righter than the right. Which means, if we're going to build coalitional politics for policy change, the left is the way to go. And I wonder why my sensed distance between the movement that Mr. Cecilia heads and the left in Mexico. If the left is the natural ally for true policy change and for a challenge in the prevailing culture. Even though Mr. Lopez Obrador may be kind of a wild card in his own, right? And I, and I, and I have to confess, I voted for, for Josefina Vasquez Mota, just as I had voted for Calderon six years ago. But I think the allies are on the left. That's the people that can bring about the change because the, the PRI cannot be relied on bringing about that. I think it will radicalize the policy. It will, it is now committed to demonstrate that it is even righter than the PAN. And I think that for policy change in Mexico, it's not going to be a, a generous environment in that sense. And we're going to have to, to work on that. What we'll miss about the PAN, though, and this is another danger for this <coughs> movement, is that 
under the pond, though a right-wing party, there was freedom of the press for the most part. There was open challenge to the government and witness Luz Maria Davila in Ciudad Juarez yelling out loud in a forum to the president after she lost her two sons in the massacre of Salvarcar and challenging the president in public. And she's still there in Ciudad Juarez. She still lives there and she's still an activist. The pun was consumed by the stubbornness of the president, not by its ability to be a democratic party. The PRI will consume not itself, but the country, because it will move further to the right. And then it will bring back some of the vices that will make it very, very difficult for true policy change in Mexico. So I suggest again that the coalition is on the left and I would like Mr. Cecilia to address these strategic issues of coalition building and, and the political parties and the environment for to turn this movement into public policy. Two, two more questions and then I'll allow Bill Martin to speak. I do think that President Calderon made terrible mistakes. I do think that President Calderon chose the wrong policy. I think that President Calderon is a stubborn man who doesn't know how to turn. He is not designed to know how to go back and reverse or how to make right and left turns. The guy only knows how to go forward. That is just the way he's made. That is his ideology, that is his party, that is the way he thinks. But the numbers of the decomposition in Mexico in regard to drug policy are not Calderon's alone. Those of us who have studied Chihuahua and Ciudad Juarez and the war on drugs realize that the number of deaths has been climbing since the 1990s. In fact, if you look at the numbers in Chihuahua, when we entered the year 2000, there were about 200 murders a year. By the mid-2004, 2005, the number had more than doubled, almost tripled, to 700 per year. And that was not under Calderon's watch. And it had already gone up under Cedillo's watch. And then it just skyrocketed under Calderon. So the, the problem is not, in my view, Calderon himself. The man made things worse. But there was something more deeply wrong with the policy and the country itself. Because those of us who track the numbers know that the numbers go much further back than Mr. Calderon. He only made it worse, but I think there's something else. Focalizing the blame on Mr. Calderon will be easy. The man, as Mr. Cecilio said, will pay his own price. He'll have to sleep with himself. He'll have to live with himself. But there's something else about Mexico that needs to be looked at and analyzed and very carefully, carefully examined. So why focalize the blame there? Why not spread out and rethink the whole issue of drug policy? Not as Mr. Calderon's problem or doing. He only made things worse, but this is something that was already brewing before. And thinking about this strategic issues, what comes next after the caravan? <clears throat> when Washington, D.C., is, has been visited in the next, uh, I think, <coughs> September 7th or whenever you get to Washington, D.C. What comes next? How to turn this protest, what began as protest and seems to be turning into a movement, how to turn it into public policy? How to make that leap? What comes next? What are the plans for this after Washington, D.C.? And I leave uh, uh, these, uh, pro these questions, I guess, these three issues for Mr. Cecilia, perhaps as some uh, uh, as, um, um, questions to, to reflect upon afterwards. But I'm going to ask Bill to offer his even wiser advice. Uh, um, obviously, I don't dare <laughs> compare my thinking to, to Bill's, but, but I think Bill will enlighten us even, even more than, uh, than I have on, on this issue. Bill? 
Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to say how happy we are to have Tony Payan with us for a six month period. And I pre certainly appreciate the fact that he's so appropriately humble. And um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, um, I have the, the privilege to direct the drug policy program here at the Baker Institute. And we do try to deal with policy. The, the goal of the program, as is stated on our website, is to reduce the personal and social damage drug use and drug policy can cause by developing alternative, pragmatic policies based on common sense, driven by human rights interests, and focused on reducing the death, disease, crime, and suffering associated with drug use and its prohibition. A sensible policy seeks to reduce the violence associated with drug prohibition. An unknown number from at least 50,000 and maybe 100,000 or maybe far more than that have died in Mexico in the last five plus years as a consequence of war between drug cartels and between the cartels and Mexican <coughs> government forces. This is often called drug violence, but they are not killing each other because they want marijuana to smoke or because they want cocaine to snort, or because they're high on meth. They're fighting over the billions of dollars they can make by selling drugs whose price has been inflated beyond reason by prohibition. The most dangerous drug in our society, most destructive drug, without doubt, is alcohol. I could elaborate on that, but, and, and almost always do, but I'm not going to right now. However, Anheuser-Busch, Miller Coors, Jack Daniels, do not shoot it out on street corners over control of territory <laughs> as the criminal gangs did during Prohibition and as the drug cartels do now in Mexico as they fight with each other and with government forces. Sensible policy seeks to, I always think I'm going to be the one. <laughs> Sensible policy seeks to reduce violence by regulating and taxing drugs as we regulate and tax alcohol, tobacco, and prescription drugs with a range of appropriate restrictions rather than leave the control of production and distribution in the hands of criminal gangs who have no incentive whatever to distribute them responsibly. Sensible policy will look at the facts about drug abuse and formulate a relevant response. According to reputable data, 90% of people over 26 who have a substance abuse disorder developed it before age 18. One in four people who develop a, a who have a, a who use tobacco or alcohol or an addictive drug before 18 becomes dependent on the drugs. Only one in 25 who start at age 21st, 21 or later. Sensible policy will provide teens and adults who have a substance abuse disorder with appropriate treatment. And that may have to be long term, just as we treat diabetes long term. Sensible policy will. Uh, well, even if it's long term, it's a savings. A RAND Corporation study estimated that, or concluded, that every dollar spent on treat drug treatment was, is worth $7 in, for law enforcement measures, $10 in trying to interdict drugs, and $23 in trying to eradicate them at the source. It's still a cost. It would be better if we didn't have to spend it, but if we're going to spend tens of billions of dollars on sub problems of substance abuse, we should spend it this way instead of enforcing a regimen of prohibition that has been a demonstrable and catastrophic failure. Michelle Alexander, who wrote the really important book, The New Jim Crow, and who will be speaking on October the 2nd with the Progressive Forum, uh, put that on your calendar, please, uh, estimated that $1, billion, $1 trillion has been spent on the drug war since 1980. She said that could have been used for schools, economic investments in our poorest neighborhoods, job creation, small businesses. Instead, the war on drugs paved the way for the destruction of countless lives, families, and dreams. Now, we talked to Tommy brought up about specific policies. I want to mention several policies that are in existence in other places that do work. They're not perfect. Every one of them has problems, but they work much better than what we do most of the places in the United States. One is to, take, to, to use a public health approach, and Mr. Cecilia has talked about this. In 1994, the Swiss government began a nationwide trial program in which some 1,000 hardcore heroin addicts were allowed to use as much pharmaceutical-grade heroin as they wished with clean needles in a supervised setting. 
After three years, and it's been followed up after that, this experiment was declared a great success. Criminal offenses and the number of criminal offenders dropped 60% and later 80%. The percentage of income from illegal and semi-illegal activities fell from 69% to 10%. Physical health improved enormously. There were no deaths from overdoses. A substantial number of the, of the participants began abstinence treatment. They were tired of being addicts. Stable employment increased from 14% to 32%. As Rush Limbaugh has shown, it's possible to work effectively for years <laughs> while addicted to high-powered opiates. <laughs> this has been expanded in Switzerland, and it now includes cocaine in some places. The similar effects are underway or in, under consideration in other countries in Europe and also in Canada. Methadone maintenance using synthetic opiates can work, maybe even working better because for one thing it's legal, Methadone patients can derive safely, hold good jobs, care for their children. With adequate doses, they can be indistinguishable from people who have never taken any kind of drug. For every 10 addicts, however, there are one to two treatment slots. Compare that to where to thousands of general practitioners in Europe who can deal with individual patients and provide methadone maintenance. They are still addicted, but it reduces the harm, it protects us from their crimes, it saves enormous sums, and it does not enrich criminals. It ought to be made more widely available. People whose lives are stable have a better chance of kicking drugs altogether. Portugal, in 2001, decriminalized the possession of drugs for personal use and concurrently initiated a national program of treatment and harm reduction measures. Ten years later, a number of key health outcomes have improved. Fewer people die of overdoses. HIV transmission rates among drug use, injecting drug users has decreased significantly. There's been a decline in drug use among adolescents, the ones we are most concerned about. There was a fear, this sends the wrong message. There'll be drug tourism, there'll be enormous increase in drugs. None of that happened. This innovative approach to a solving drug problems has brought experts from around the world to see what they might borrow from it. In the Netherlands, they chose a policy of depenalization in the coffee shops, which really don't sell much coffee. But, they are <laughs> <laughs> but for the hashish and marijuana that's available there, there's no advertising, no sales to minors, no large sales, no hard drugs. Cannabis use is lower than in the United States. Also, hard drugs are lower than in the United States. It's not plot perfect, but it's better than what we have. The Dutch are near the middle of marijuana use among European countries, with 20% of adults having used marijuana, compared to over 40% in the US. For adolescents, the figures are 14% and 39%. Almost no one has been arrested for personal use or possession in 25 years. The use of harder drugs is significantly lower than in the United States because they have cut the tie between the dealer who wants to sell something more expensive. The lifetime use of cocaine in, in, the, in the Netherlands is, ranges in different studies between one-eighth to one-sixteenth of what we have in the United States. Another policy, which is catching on in this country, lowest priority policies. It was pioneered in Seattle with an initiative 75. It doesn't change the laws. They don't want to get into trouble with that, with, the, with, other, you know, with the law enforcement. But with the approval of the DA, the police, the chief of police, the sheriff, the, AB, the bar association, everyone, the judges, they decided officially to make enforcement of marijuana laws the lowest police priority. They just said, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't catch it. We, we're, we're interested in other things. After three years, four years, there was no increase in drug use, no increase in crime related to drugs. Other cities are adopting this. No other harms that could be seen from that policy. Sensible policy seeks to reduce the harm caused by reliance on imprisonment as a key weapon in the war on drugs. Mr. Cecilia has talked about this last night, mentioning that the United States has 5% of the population, 25% of the people who are incarcerated in the world. 2.3 million. Second is the People's Republic of China with 1.6 million, with four times the population. Drug convictions play an enormous role in that. Nearly a half million people are in prison because of drug offenses. 
Many more have felony records. That compares to 41,000 in 1980. If abusers kill or rob or rape, putting them in jail or prison might be an appropriate response. But unless they're causing such harm to others, they shouldn't be incarcerated simply for using or possessing illicit drugs any more than we incarcerate drunks if they are not disorderly. The people are ahead of the leadership on this. When polled, people almost invariably choose treatment over incarceration. And a substantial number of politicians understand this, but will say, and some have said to me, I'm afraid I'd get primaried if I, and they, they, might, they might well. Minorities suffer much more severely on this. The rates of use of the various drugs are similar among blacks, Latinos, and, and Caucasians. But blacks, in a study in the Stanford Law Review, are found to be 10 times more likely to be put into state prison than whites, 10 times more likely. This has increased the cynicism of minorities who know they are the subjects of discrimination. That easily extends to other laws, to law in general, and a loosening of any psychic bond to society and its norms. That harms democracy and the rule of law. And since last night Mr. Cecilia talked about Jesus, you talked about Jesus and Paul, this ought to offend religious people, particularly Christians. Jesus himself died in custody as a prisoner, as were Peter and Paul and John the Baptist. Christianity was founded by men in deep trouble with the law who knew what it was like to be in, Christ in prison. Jesus taught his followers <coughs> to imagine themselves hearing his voice. Whether you think, whatever, whoever you think Jesus was, I suspect most of you have a reasonably positive view. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you came to me. And finally, I was in prison and you visited me. Imagine having Jesus say to you, I was in prison and you did not visit. I was in prison and you did not care. Or if we do not do all in our power to change laws that imprison people at an unconscionable rate, I was in prison because you let it happen. Okay, I'm going to serve as a moderator as well, uh, so I'm gonna throw some questions out there. Uh, the first one seems to be a question for me. Would William Buckley be considered a flaming liberal today? Probably. Uh, it's the country has moved so far right that even William Buckley today would be a moderate Republican probably. So yes, uh, that's, I think I, I agree with that. Uh, the, uh, I posed a couple of questions for Mr. Cecilia in the, in the form of uh, reflections. I think that he'll, he'll have a chance to, uh, to reply to that. And then maybe I should ask these questions and then you can, uh, you can just address them uh, 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 in, in groups. Uh, uh, the ones I threw in there, and then I'll 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 put two on the table, uh, and uh, and then you can uh, uh, you can reply to the to those. Uh, in regard to uh, the issue of legalization, I kind of group them, so I'm going to ask them together, so we can save a little time. Uh, in regard to legalization, ¿usted cree que si se eh, llegaran a legalizar las drogas en México, los diferentes carteles del narcotráfico Dejarán de pelearse por su Will territorio y dejarán de matar Will a los jóvenes que reclutan the para abatir a sus contrincantes. Uh, la the la, the la I, legalización detendrá esta legalización will have this effect? Otra pregunta. And the other question is, uh, given the current state of the drug war, what are the benefits? Uh, that more, more than would offset the consequences of legalization. That, I'll leave that in terms of legalization. 
and I'll ask another one that's kind of related. Yeah. Uh, what 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 are the benefits of legalization that would offset? What are the benefits of the legalization that could result in benefits or bigger advantages for that would make it better than maintaining the prohibition? Another question that has to do with finances, with uh, money for the war The cartels in Mexico have now diversified and own many legitimate businesses. What do we do about that? And then I'll come back to these other three groups in a minute. I, they are making uh, you know, some signs to me. I think I'm going to have to leave the room for one minute if we have something else going. I, I apologize, but we have so many things. Legalization of drugs will stop violence in Mexico. It will help. Um, the problem from my standpoint is that Calderón's strategy, and uh, this is the huge responsibility that Tony was talking about, Auspiciada por los Estados Unidos, por uh, toda la his policy is sponsored by the U.S. because all the military intelligence came from the U.S. Uh, what it did was something terrible. Uh, he o sea, got the heads out of the guerra. cartels. That's what he did. First of all, they fought a war. Fue, when it became a war, you sort of force, you force your enemy to arm themselves, and they arm themselves in such way that they can fight you know, against these armies. So, you got entire armies put together. I mean, they were they were organized crime armies, but they were organized and they had weapons, weapons, very powerful weapons. These people became armies. Many of these people, like the Zetas, they, you know, they they were trained at the School of the Americas, and uh, the School of the Americas has trained criminals. The Caviles were also trained there, and. This is something that, you know, has developed armies. And when you took the heads, the, the, the bosses out, when you got the capos, the, the, the bosses out, what happens is you end up with an army that is, is not under anybody's control. There's nobody in charge. And so crime just multiplies. And Calderon's strategy, what it has done is it has multiplied crime. It has increased crime. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's more human traffic, kidnappings. Why? Because those people that control the business, uh, they're gone. And, uh, you know, they don't deal in drugs anymore and they have to make a living. So that's what they do. When they said when uh, Comandante H was arrested, supposedly he was in charge, he was uh, with one of the cells that uh, supposedly killed my son. They said, well, kill Beltran Leiva. He was one of the capos, one of the big bosses in Cuernavaca. And they said, well, get his lieutenants. And Comandante H was the only one left. And so what happens at the time, you, you get all these other crime cells that sort of, you know, rise up. My son was killed for, what, 200,000 pesos and a couple of trucks? And I, I didn't know anything about Comandante H. I, I went to ask. Um, you know, I, I wanted, I asked the, the, the person who interrogated him and I said, well, how does this relate to what happened to my son, to the kids? And, and they told me it has nothing to do with your son. And when I heard that, I got so angry, but I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't do anything about what I was hearing. And they said, well, that's not our business. What's going on is not our business. Drugs are our business. If they had legalized drugs, if Felipe Calderon and the U.S. had showed a different hand attitude when facing these drug cartels, they would have become just business people. They would have been under control. Uh, we wouldn't have had armies. We wouldn't have had this strategy of getting the bosses out and, and just crime out of control. So there is criminal responsibility on the part of the politicians, uh, Felipe Calderón and his government. It is true 
que el problema What Tony antes. says that the problem you know, started before that. Pero ya That's ya true. Había que and, and, and we would have to track and, and see where exa exactly started, you know, this uh, change to these uh, neoliberal policies that they pre had. But I mean, that's a different topic. But the, that's the big benefit of legalization, Antonio. I think described it very well, and Bill also described it very well. Either you control it, you invest the money in other things, the, the money that you use for violence, you can invest that money for something else. You can invest it in public health, you can invest it for uh, you know, things that would benefit the social fabric, prevention programs, and taxes, taxes that you would receive because of drugs. I mean, you can see nothing's going to happen. And, and you can look at what happened with alcohol. The, you know, the decade of the 20s was lost in the US until finally you know, alcohol was legalized and all of a sudden crime dropped and everything got better and there is alcohol today alcohol is still a problem it's still a public health problem it's still a market problem but it there are controls, the state bueno, manages them. Legales, so, pues sí. you know, when it becomes a legal business, you, you can manage them. Uh, but really, you know, right now, dinero, you know, they, they, they do they have legal businesses, but they're not their real businesses. It's the way they launder money, for instance, and it's the way they face society. But these cartels are not really interested in their legal business. They are interested in their illegal activities. And, uh, you know, of course, they, uh, if they had more legal businesses, they would have more uh, revenues. But the, the legal businesses they have, they, they're just being used to launder money. And they, they make the illegal into legal. It is because you have these corrupt authorities um, in the government. And they use, you know, they use the government to keep operating or to keep financing their criminal activities. In Mexico, we have a lot of these people. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave. I'm being very happy uh, to be here. I mean, that uh, th this is my environment. I, I'm not really an activist, but I'm, I'm very happy, but I have to make it uh, to another appointment and I have to be on time. Do we have three or four minutes to ask no, one more one one more reflection, one more question? But I want to I, I want to ask these questions, and I want to hear your last final words. Uh, one of them has to do with the actors. What can citizens do? What can the people do? The, the emphasis being both Mexican and American citizens. What can we do in this regard? Why do leaders, for instance, the church, why don't they have a voice? In, in this area and what is the role that you know migrants can play especially migrants from mexico in this regard and in the us the green party is pro legalization is there any party in mexico that is pro legalization and finally what do you think about the, uh, the the new president of Mexico and what's uh, happening in probably September or November, December. Uh, I don't know if you can give us your opinion about that in 30 seconds. <laughs> Many questions and big questions. I think that uh, these two questions, you know, the, the uh, Mexican migrants to the U.S. and the church, what could they do? I think this is the time for citizens. I think we, we uh, I think we're living a time where I, which I, I would compare to the fall of the Roman Empire, you know the uh, uh, institutions that we have, uh, all the things, institutions that came out of the head of Hobbes to this, this uh, model of capital, uh, it's, it's in a crisis now, but also the economic model, the economic model that came out of the 17th century and uh, what Marx continued trying to moralize capital. And that's in crisis too. And it's a historic construction and like every human historic construction, they have their expiration date, they're, they're dying. And the, uh, what's clear is that parties now don't represent anything more than the interests of capital. So we want to see who will win here. It's like with Peña Nieto. I mean, we citizens don't count. Uh, policies are uh, made. 
uh, based on uh, interests. We have to understand that that's how corrupt the state is. Parties are bad with those interests. So this is a change, and we, uh, we don't want to see that. But those main axes that have ruled human history for the last few centuries are falling apart. And the only thing we have left is the citizens, the citizenry. And citizens have to start to try to change those policies. This uh, movement, this big changes, big rifts in, in history, uh, remember uh, the changes, big changes in Europe uh, with the uh, monasteries. Uh, uh, right now, we have new movements emerging. And we have a uh, situation like in Mexico, that barbarism, but which are these movements that are now marginal, but that are coming up with something new? Because this is not sustainable anymore. Uh, they're called maybe Zapatistas, the, our movement for peace, the occupiers, uh, the 99%, the outrage in Spain, you know, or the Arab Spring. Those marginal movements are now beginning beginning to come up with something new. And this new thing doesn't have anything to do with state policies or party policies. That's why Peña Nieto, well, we don't care whoever may have won. The problem in Mexico, like in the US, and you will see that pretty soon, is a structural problem. It's a crisis of institutions. That's why the church is not even responding or reacting, because they serve different interests. I think it's a crisis of institutions, institutions that are not responding anymore. Who's responding to the migratory problem? Well, people on the margins, like Sol Alinde in Mexico, protecting migrants. Uh, we, we complain uh, and we have to be very critical about this. We complain about the migratory and the immigration policies of the U.S. and the way immigrants are treated. Well, the way we treat Central Americans is three times worse. We need to feel ashamed. We don't mistreat them like our payo does here. We just let them disappear. There's no way, no means of protecting those Central American migrants. And we have to protect these marginal movements. Uh, Father Solalin, there's a problem for the church too. All those priests that are, are dedicating their work to save those migrants, they represent a problem for the church too. So these marginal movements are responding now, are doing what the states are not doing. It's a shame, I think, that we have to call the government to the Chapultepec Palace and to tell them what they haven't done and what we have done without any money. The state, the only thing they have done is they have run a war. We have to carry the victims. What President Calderon did after fighting for a, uh, a law to protect victims, what he did was veto it. So, is this our function? We have to tell the state what to do? But uh, it seems that that's what we have to do. If, if we don't have Solalinde, if we don't work with migrants or with victims, nobody does. Even though we have the judiciary, we have the executive, we have all the power of the state, but they do absolutely nothing. And that's absolute evidence of the crisis of institutions and historical parties. So whether Peña Nieto won or if they, you know, whoever uh, may have won. It's, the problem would be the same. It's not a problem of people, it's a problem of structures, institutions are in crisis. And in Mexico, they're also rotten. So it's, it's very serious. Instead of saying, well, how does the old model respond to this, we should say, how do we build a new model, democratic relations, economic relations, that cannot be based anymore on the idea of development. And development is, is a lie, and we see the consequences of that lie, the impoverishment, the destruction of cultures, destruction of the environment. Uh, there can't be an economy for development or and for riches in, in a world that's self-sustainable. The world does not produce riches, it's just self-sustainable. So the logic of the, the water cycle is, is very clear. We're saying there's a shortage of water. No, it's simply that we have abused, we have overused water. Water has been for millions of years the same. You know, if that goes up there, it's, it's liquid 
is solid, but we have done, we have, we have polluted it, we have hoarded it. There's no shortage of water. You can ask the Tuaregs in the desert. They have survived for perhaps millennia in the Saharan desert with what we call a shortage of water. No Tuareg, as, as far as I know, has died of thirst. They've died of many other things, but not of thirst. So let's we need to uh, study this economic logic. What should the economy be like? Remember, economy is not just maximizing capital the way it's thought about now. The economy is just taking care of your own household. That's that's the, the uh, etymology of the word. So we need to also rethink democracy in its original sense, the power of people, not just representative voting uh, parties. That's all in crisis. And there's something new that's emerging. We have to reinvent that because what we have after the fall of these institutions is barbarism, if not. It's like the fall of the empire. We have either state barbarism or society barbarism. What we have now in Mexico, it is a society that's destroyed and is about to lose its civil liberties, at least it's happening in Mexico and Central America. So we have to think about something new. And we have to think that we are at a big rift. The waters are parting now as far as civilizations. Uh, this the institutions that we have now were born only maybe three centuries ago. And just like the empire fell, these are falling. The fascist state fell, the communist state has fallen, and now the liberal state is falling. What will come next? Well, that's what we have to start thinking, what we have to start try to see in the, the history of this the social movements that are emerging. But I'm going to have to leave you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. To